Welcome to the Rap Race to Five podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place. Here to challenge you to think out of the box, your hosts, Felipe Mejia and Diego Corzo. Yo, Diego, what's up, man? We're super excited. Today we have Rafael Estrada on the Rat Race to Five podcast, a fellow Peruvian like yourself. He's going to tell us how he went from working at Carl's Jr. to flipping condos to now doing seven figure year flips with some a pretty cool niche. I won't tell you guys what it is. I'll, I'll let you listen to the podcast and uh, listen to the end because he gives out the sauce. Yes, and I am very excited too because he gets to share how he came here to the United States, the obstacles that he had. Uh, he couldn't work or drive until he was 22. And it's just a super inspirational story. And I know the audience is going to love it. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get started. I love it. What's <laughs> up, guys? Welcome to the Rat Race to Five podcast. So it always cracks me up when we do the clap thing, Diego. So for those of you guys that are listening, uh, we always do this clap thing, the synchronize the mics. And I was like, all right, guys, on three, we're going to clap one, two. And then I clap faster than everyone else. And I know that it messes up the engineer. He's like, oh, my gosh, Felipe. <laughs> Anyways, today we have an awesome guest. We have Rafael, who is killing it in the flipping game. Uh, I actually recorded him on a different podcast when he was first starting out. Uh, so I'm super excited to have him. Diego, what's up, man? Rafa, what's going on, bro? What's up? What's up, dude? Felipe, I'm very excited because today we get to interview a fellow Peruvian like myself, uh, on, on the podcast and hear his story because it's super inspirational. So I can't wait. Okay. Before we get started though, Rafa, can you, okay. So a Mexican can walk down the street and we can see other Mexicans and we know they're Mexican. I don't know how, but we can. Can Peruvians <laughs> do the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. I would yeah. say yes. You would say yes. What is especially, it? Especially if you hear them because they're loud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or like if you hear him talk, if you hear a Peruvian talk, you can tell that they're you Peruvian, like yeah. immediately. But there are times where you can see somebody and you be like, oh, this person's Peruvian. Like I've done it. Yeah. And I'm like, this person has to be Peruvian. That's hilarious. All right. So before actually, okay, you know what? I'm interested about another thing that we're going to talk about real quick before we get to Rafa's story. And I want to hear Rafael's uh, take on this as well. Um. I did this thing on my stories the other day where I tipped a uh, waitress. Oh, I think oh, I think it was a waiter. I can't remember. Anyways, I tipped him $100 and I do it all the time. But I this time I posted it and I, I got really mixed DMs about it. They're like, oh, you should keep that to yourself. And there were some people that were like, oh, that's encouraging. I'm going to go try to do that as well. And then I would get other people like, oh, you're just flaunting that you have money. And then other people were like, oh, dude, I never thought about like blessing other people in that way. That would be easier. Yada, yada, yada. So. I, I challenged some of my business partners, Diego and a bunch of other people to do it. Um, so Rafa, I want to ask you, how do you feel about that? Should we post those things to encourage other people to do it? Or should we play the humble card and, and not? And that's OK. Like, you know, if you're just doing it for your personal self, then great. But how do you feel about that, Rafa? And then I want to have Diego's take because Diego just did it. Yeah. Um so my, my take on everything, I think, is that people are always going to say what they want to say, no matter what you do, whether it's good, bad, whatever a case is. You're always going to have the people talking back, even if you're doing great, you know. Um, now, I'm super into that. So it's like, you know, post, post it, you know, it encourages people. It's kind of like to get everyone on the same board, you know. I feel like the more, because I mean, the way that I see it is if nobody sees it, nobody does it. So it doesn't, because, you know, when you see something or a trend, you're more likely to do it you know, mm -hmm. and especially if it's good, you know, if it's good, if it's for a good cause, you know, giving someone our homeless a hundred bucks or food, whatever the case is, because you see those YouTubes that have like million views. And because of those other, there's other YouTubers doing it as well. So I think, I think it creates a kind of like a domino effect for people who do it. I mean, you're always going to get people saying, ah, oh, you shouldn't post it, you know, yada, yada. But at the end, I, I think it's good. I think it's good to, you know, to a certain, I mean, don't do it where you feel like, you know, you're on top of it and throwing like a hundred dollars on the floor and people grab, you know, you know, don't do none of that weird stuff. But, but I think if you're, you know, recording it for a good purpose and, you know, everyone it's, you know, it's helping everyone, then I think go for it. Yeah. 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 Diego, you recently did it. So tell the story and then we're going to run into Raphael's story of 
what uh what got him into real estate but i'll let diego go ahead and tell your story real quick yeah so basically on sunday we went to eat and uh when i so i so we went there and it was a little bit late uh but he was really good waiter and uh and at the end uh i i had given him a good tip but then i remember you felipe when you shared it and you, and you tagged me you're like hey diego you're next and uh, so i erased it and then i put a hundred on it and uh and i was like and it felt good and to the point that when he took the the receipt he came back i'm like did you write this the right way and i was like yeah i did he's like oh thank you so much and then he showed another waiter and they were like super happy um so yeah it definitely felt really good to do that and it makes me want to do it more often and felipe i know that we've done it twice yeah um, yeah so rat race has done cool. it twice so yeah yeah rat race our, our brand our, our mastermind and this podcast um we have compassion kids with compassion international that we sponsor and then we've we do pretty large uh tips when we go out especially as a group so yeah okay well that's exciting i just wanted to like talk about yeah. that because because i never know like how people feel about that and 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 having a platform i'm not like huge in or anything but having 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 a small social media platform um you know, we, we post about those things, but we also don't want people to make it feel like egotistical. It's more like, can we empower other people to give? Because I don't know the formula or the ROI on this, but Brandon Turner and a bunch of the other uh, moguls in real estate talk about giving has an exponential ROI. We, there's just not a formula there. I, I don't know how, but like giving always comes back a hundred times over. Um, anyways, all right. So glad that's, that's talked about. Uh, for you guys that are listening, definitely send us a DM and tell us what you think about it. Um, you can find Diego and I, you know, where you can find us on, on Instagram or on rat race to Fi. Rafa, tell us about you, dude. Like on social media, you, you post a lot about your flips and they look ridiculously amazing, but not just that you're flipping in like the top 10 hottest markets in the country and like most expensive Colorado, right? Yeah. Yes. Like that's not easy, my guy. So it's impressive that because like when somebody flips in like pine bluff arkansas a fifty thousand dollar property i'm like okay like that's cute like i don't want to bring that down by any means but like it's not super risky but you're flipping 300 four hundred thousand dollar properties um you're getting into like higher end properties you yeah. started out with like two one condos now you're doing like four bedroom mm -hmm. like like mm -hmm. nice stuff so we're gonna get to that so make sure that you're listening to the end but let's get started with, dude, who were you in high school and in college? Like, what was your clique? What were your friend group? Give us a little backstory on who you are. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my name is Rafael Estrada. I'm from Peru. Uh, so funny story about me is I moved to America right for high school. So I, you know, when I was, a lot of people don't know this, but I was 14 at the time. Um, so I always felt like everyone that was born here had 14 years ahead of me. So that's, that's kind of how I saw everything. And I always had 14 years that I had to make up. Um, so yeah, definitely I came right for high school. They put me in all the ESL classes. You know, the only class that I had with actual people that spoke English was um, PE, which is physical education. Uh, every other class I was, you know, with Asians, you know, Africans, you, know, you name it, people that barely spoke any English. So, but there was only one, one thing that I was good at, which was math. Cause you know, as if you're from Peru, you know, your math levels are very, very high from you know elementary middle school so that's something i always killed it people always were impressed why i did things without a calculator because over there you can't do things with a calculator they'll they'll like suspend you or something but here everybody had a calculator so that's kind of and then my click was um i don't know I, I wouldn't say there was too many people there i mean the people that i met I, I hang out with a lot of asians and all that but right when i came i started working so it was school work so right as soon as I got off uh, school, I had to go into work. My first job was Sonic, uh, you know, Sonic, the fast food place um, with, with the roller skate. So and I remember I was there for a month and I got fired because I, I didn't know English. So they were ordering like a burger and I thought it was a shake and they, they would get a shake. And I'm like, this is not what I ordered. So I would get somebody to complain. Wait, but did you wear the short shorts <laughs> and, the, and the skates? No, no. Come on, <laughs> be honest. No, I, I wore the honest. slacks. <laughs> yeah, I wore the slacks. Yeah, yeah, I wore the slacks and all that. But I mean, it was that's kind of how my story was. But I, I guess I wouldn't. I didn't hang out with a lot of people outside of uh, school just because I had to work. You know, my parents taught me from when I was young is like, if you want a phone, 
you gotta go get it yourself. If you want a new bed, go get it yourself. If you want a, your own first computer, I got it myself. First desk, I got it myself. So that's kind of how I, I was, I guess, trained or raised. So, so kind of learn everything by my own and earn it myself. So that is why I wasn't really into like sports or, you know, any partying after school or kickbacks, yada, yada. It was, it was just me and work. I mean, I did skateboard a little bit. So I guess if there was a click, that I would say is that was probably my skateboarding uh, crews that like, you know, the crew that I had back in the day. Cause I felt like when I was holding a skateboard, I was fitting in into the American culture. So that, that is one of the reasons why I got my skateboard. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy because at, at the end of the day, it's like we, are, we come to a new country, right? And we try to assimilate um, to what, like to what the other people are doing. And I've done a couple of things like that when like eating, eating like a like eating food that wasn't what i liked as much but because other americans were eating sandwiches yeah. with peanut butter and jelly i was eating it and i'm like i don't even like this but i was eating it because my friends were eating it so yeah totally can totally can relate so you came over at 14 yeah. not even knowing the language and then and, and that's what i love about like this country si tienes las ganas you can make anybody can make it some of the most successful yeah. people in this country are immigrants, right? And like, that's amazing. Um, so it's really cool, like of what you're doing and seeing your growth, Rafael, from the last time I, re I, um, I recorded you on a podcast. Okay, so did you go to college? Yeah, I tried to go. To, I, I went to college. This is back before, uh, was it DACA around? So I remember one class was like 10K and my parents, my parents helped me out. They paid for it. And then like two classes, it was like 20K and were, everything was out of pocket. There was no, you know, uh, no help from the government, none of that, you know, help and fast or whatever it's called. I don't remember what it's called, but so it was like a straight cash out of pocket. And my parents were like, yeah, we'll help you out. But then after like two, you know, two, um, two semesters, I was like, yeah, this is not really for me. And like, you know, I don't really want you guys to spend all this money if I'm not really sure. So I was just like, I got into the banking world. That's kind of when I got where I got into the bank that's when that started banking. you went you went and worked at a bank yeah i worked at a bank yeah i was working yeah. at carl's jr for like forever that was my my second job i actually saw a video of you recently on instagram yeah. juggling you were, you were <laughs> juggling really cool and i was like this dude is now running a real estate empire or he could have been a clown like i'm glad you chose the other way <laughs> yeah yeah that, that's actually funny because that's that's back in the day when i was at carl's jr i was there for like six seven years because um, at the time, you know, they started the e-verify where they have to, if you get a new employment or a new job, they have to verify that you make sure you have legit papers. You know, back then I didn't really have any papers. So, uh, so I had to, I was stuck at that job and, you know, I couldn't be a manager because if you wanted to be a manager, they had to verify your, that you have real papers and all that. So I was like, okay, whatever, I'm going to be a cashier for a while. And I just had try to have fun as much as possible. You know, I had, I, I took their paper receipts and I started learning how to juggle, just watch YouTube learn a new trick then watch more youtube learn another new trick and then i got super good at it then i was like man i should probably work in a circus but but i didn't i didn't go that route <laughs> so for people so for people that don't know about e-verify i can explain a little bit i was i worked in hr for a while e-verify was an automatic elect electronic way to see if somebody's um social security was right or wrong so right before that came out i can't remember exactly when it came out but right before that came out what would happen is like you worked at Carl's Jr. You would fill out your application to work there. Um, and then what would happen is you would uh, put your your Social Security on there. And then at random, this the city would or the government or whoever would ask, let's say, Carl's Jr. Hey, Carl's Jr., I need you to send us all the applications for 10 of your stores. We need to make sure that they're legit Social Security. So people could work for years with a false Social Security and no one would find out. But as soon as E-Verify came out, like that made it a lot, a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Rafael, quick question. So you were, you got to, you graduated high school, you got to college. Um, could you drive? Like, could you no. get a driver's license? No, right? No. So you couldn't drive, you couldn't get student loans, you couldn't get financial aid um nothing of that right but you still managed to go through at least for a couple of semesters um but what was that feeling when like you finally got the work permit the daca oh. documents and finally being able to 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 drive 
Yeah, uh, it was actually a really good feeling because, you know, being in high, uh, in high school, you know, you get to see everyone with their cars and all that stuff. And I would always ask my parents, hey, you know, when can I have a car? And they're like, well, you don't have papers, so you can't have a car. I was like, okay, whatever. Then, then, then you know, you will see everyone like having jobs, like cool jobs. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm at a fast food place. Like back then when I used to skateboard, I wanted to work at a skate shop. Like I thought a skate shop or a gym, something cool, you know, that was cool back then. And then, well, you had E-Verify, you had to have papers. I was like, okay, whatever, I'm stuck at Carl Jr. You know, so the minute that I got my my paper, my DACA, you know, my social security, like, shoot, it like, like I felt like I could like take on the world. You know, it was like it was like the best feeling ever. Like I was already saving up. I had money saved up for my car, but I couldn't get a car because I didn't have a license. So that money was always sitting in, in the savings account that I actually nicknamed car. That, that, that's what it was nicknamed. And I had like two thousand dollars. So it wasn't a lot of money. So uh, I remember, because um, my parents, they weren't going to buy it for me. They're like, if you want your cell phone, you got to buy it for you. I think my first cell phone was when I was 18. So it wasn't even, it was like after high school. So I remember they always had to text my mom or call my mom or ring the doorbell back when they used to ring the doorbell. Um, and then my first car was actually at 22. 22 years old is when I got my driver's license and my, uh, my car. So, but it was, it was the best film. I think as a parent, I would maybe help you out a little just for safety, <laughs> like the car, making sure it wasn't like a car or a safer car. That's funny. All right. So, man, I think one of the biggest reasons that we did this podcast, uh, Rafa, Diego and I, is so that people can also see like the struggle that immigrants have when coming into this country and then moving to real estate. Right. Because a lot of people say, oh, real estate's hard to get into. Like, dude, I know hundreds and thousands of stories of people that are in real estate, like you and Diego, who didn't even have your social security. So like you said, you started 14 years behind anyone else. These are stories that I couldn't tell before, but I knew I knew that I wanted to tell these stories now. So that's huge. Okay, so let's get into now real estate. You didn't even have the capability of getting a license and you were flipping burgers. So it's kind of like that 50, this is a random, thought you guys do you guys know that 50 cent story that that or that 50 cent song burger king where he's talking or not breaking uh 21 questions i think it's called yeah where, she, where he's like would you still stay with me if i was flipping burgers at burger king <laughs> anyway super <laughs> random thought rafa how did you get into real estate like you were flipping burgers at carl's jr uh you couldn't even get a car because you didn't have a social uh you didn't speak great english what what the hell happened like what was that you to get into real estate so yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a, actually a very good question. Um, so I was working at the bank for a little while, but I always had the help of my dad. You know, he always, he always wanted me to like do better. You know, my, my hustler side comes from him. So he was always like putting things on my head or business ideas. He's like, why don't you flip cars? So I started flipping cars, you know, for a little while, like a year. I think I flipped like seven cars that first year, just buying from auction, you know, had a dealership friend and he let us borrow his license and we went to auctions and bought cars that way. Uh, and then um, he sent me like an email of this Spanish guy, like Hispanic guy that was given a, San Fran uh, a you know, like a, like a meetup in San Francisco. And then I flew out to San Francisco. I was like, hey, let's just go. So I went to San Francisco and this guy was doing flips in uh, San Francisco, which is like, you know, million dollar homes and all that. So it was all in Spanish. He came with me. He's like, hey, he, he was always like super into like making me, you know, do better, get into the room. He's like, hey, I'll pay for everything. I paid for the hotel, I paid for the plane. I was like, okay, well, let's just go. You know, let's see what happens. It was a two day uh, event. And then the guy was just saying how you can buy a home for like one mil, put like 200,000 down, like 200,000 rehab, and then sell the home for like two mil. And you make like half, you know, half a mil, which over there, it's very, very possible to make half a mil on a, on a flip. Uh, so I was hooked. You know, I talked to everyone that was there, the hard money lending. Uh, you know, there was all those different sponsors and, and that's kind of how I got into, you know, I got into that, but being prior to all that, you know, I always knew that I wanted to be into real estate. You know, I tried to get my real estate license, you know, I, I failed the test and I was just like, I'm not really a tester. Like I can't take tests. Then I, uh, you know, I got my first rental after that. Uh, but I mean, it was because of that event that I, w I saw, you know, the profits and I saw everyone hyped up in there. I came back to Colorado and just just pulled the trigger, and that was all before COVID. And how old how old were you when that happened? How old was I? Uh, it was three years ago. So was it twenty like twenty seven? Twenty seven. 
Okay, so five yeah. years since you got your your DACA documents and all that. Stuff. Yeah, and then yeah, I yeah. met you. I met you back in twenty nineteen or twenty. Yeah, in twenty nineteen. Yes. Um, that's when I got to meet you, and you told me that you were getting into the flipping side. Yeah. And yes. you were starting to flip some condos. Yeah, exactly. Right? Can you share a little bit on how you got into your first deal? Yeah, so my first deal was uh, February of the year of COVID. Um, so I had it on a contract, 10,000 non-refundable earnest money. Um, and I had it on a contract, everything was going fine, but then everything started shutting down. So I get my hard money lender is like, hey, we can't, we can't lend you no more. So I was like, oh, shoot. So I'm over there trying to call the wholesaler. Hey, I need to back out. I can't do it. The guy's like, it's a 10K non-refundable earnest money. Are you sure? And I was like, hold on, give me one second. <laughs> so I told him that. And I was like, <laughs> You're I like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I started calling my buddies. I was like, hey, do you think like the, you know, the, the market is going to crash? Like what's happening? And they're like, to be honest, dude, I don't, I don't think it's going to crash at least for like a year or so. Like usually in real estate, it takes a little bit for something to happen. So I was like, okay. And I, I talked to that guy. Then I talked to another guy that was like a big flipper in another state. And I was like, hey, do you think it's going to crash? They're like, no, I don't think it will happen that fast. So you should still pull the trigger. So I, I remember I called her, the, the wholesaler and I was like, hey, um, like I still wanted to back out at some point. And then the guy's like, well, you can't back out. I don't know if this was true or he was just lying to me. He's like, hey, this is part of an estate and there's like legal implications. Like if you back out, the owner can sue you or something. And I was like, oh crap. So now I, I can't get my 10K back and they're going to sue me or whatever. I was like, okay. I was like, well, whatever. Let's just go through with it. I found a hard money lender. After like talking to 10 of them, I found one that was like, yeah, you got to put a little bit more down but we're able to lend you. So I was like, okay, whatever, let's go. So I ended up closing like in the middle. Where, where are you getting the money to, for the down payments and stuff? Uh, I actually, uh, I did half, half with my dad. Okay. Yeah. So half, half with my dad for the down payment and then everything else I put it on like my debit card or credit card at the time. Um, yeah. So I found a hard money lender and then we closed on that property. Uh, in, initially the guy that we had, um, you know, for the, uh, to do the rehab, he had quoted us 20 K, but at the end, you know, he knew that we were new and everything. So he ended up getting like 55,000 out of us. Cause mm -hmm. like it ended up, it ended up being like a, a bigger remodel, maybe cause I also didn't know what I was doing. So I ended up making egress windows, taking off walls, you know, kind of like HGTV style, you know, and you know, I, I, I just kept saying, you know, Hey, do this or that, but it's just because I saw it on TV. Or, you know, just things that I thought it would look good, you know, because it's, it's my first deal, obviously, I don't know how to differentiate, you know, you know, what's going to work, what's not going to work. So, so, and then I ended up paying 55K and then materials and everything ended up being like a 100K rehab, which was pretty big. And then uh, after all, you know, it took like three months from the time that I bought it to sell. It took a little bit to sell because it was around uh, June and, you know, it was COVID time. Not a lot of people were buying some states were shutting down where you could only do like the, uh, like the 3d, uh, you know, the 3d walkthroughs, you couldn't walk in there. But luckily that, that week, it took like three weeks to sell. It was in the market for three weeks. Uh, and then we finally got someone to pull the trigger on it. So then they wanted us to fix a bunch of stuff on inspection. And at the end, everything was said and done. And I, after like four months, I got paid and I only made like, I think it was like 10 K. So 10K and the house was like half a mil, you know, it was like 500,000. So I made 10K, but it wasn't the most money in, you know, that I've made. And it wasn't really worth all the time and the sweat and every day that I put and all the stress that I had. But hey, I learned everything from that, from that one flip. Everything that taught me, you know, how to do things, you know, and especially me because I didn't have any background on construction, no background on any of that. I only had background in finance. So I didn't really know anything. I didn't know how lights work, how switches work, how the, I didn't even know how to like change a, a toilet or like how the faucet works. So it was, it was a learning experience for me, you know, and just being there and telling, you know, the, the person, person will send me to the, uh, to Home Depot to buy all the materials. So I, so I kind of learned where everything goes as far as material wise. So that was kind of, it was just a learning experience. That's literally what I got from that. The 10K was whatever. And, but yeah, that, that, that was like my first, my first deal. And really quick. So you bought it for how much again? I bought that one for about 350. 350. And then how much was the down payment? 
Uh, down payment was about 50,000. 50,000, and then you got a hard money lender to lend you the rest. Yeah, yes. Including the repairs, or did you have to no, come out of pocket? No, no, no. I, I, I came out of pocket the repairs, yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, so you, you were in around 100 and something into the deal. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly. So this is where I'm curious, and I don't want to get away from this. So Diego, make sure you ask a question back into the details. But this is where I get curious. You only made $10,000 in a couple of months. Why the hell did you keep doing it? Like, personally, back then, I would have been like, screw this. I'm never flipping a house again, which I'm going to be honest with you, Rafael, is exactly what I did. And I made 60 grand on my first flip. I flipped a house in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, out here of a five, uh, actually probably the same year that I met you. And I made like 60 grand on it. I was like, that took me five months, 10 grand a month. I'm never doing this again. And I never did. So I don't flip anymore. I just, I just wholesale and I have cash flow rental properties. So I focus on cash flow. Why did you keep going? And this is the difference between those who su- what you're about to say is the difference between those who succeed and those who don't. Why did you do it? Why did you keep going? Good question. Uh, so the 10K, I mean, at the time, and I wasn't making that much money. So 10K meant a little bit, even though I didn't, you know, I, even though I put all the sweat, I painted fences, I did a bunch of stuff. I even carried trash that I would never do. My back was hurting. I was so sore. So it was not worth it. But the 10K kind of meant a little bit to me, man. Like, you know, we're in the green, at least, you know, it's like, I didn't fail, you know, I didn't fail where I'm like owning, owing money and all that stuff. I didn't go bankrupt. So that's a good thing. That's a plus. And, you know, I kind of saw it like, okay, this is COVID times. I made 10K. I wasn't that great at it. But, hey, it's a learning experience. So I'm going to take this learning experience. And the funny story, funny thing that you say that is maybe because three weeks prior to, or I was already in escrow. So two weeks prior to closing, I had a little bit of money. And I was like, hey, let me go get a condo. And, and then, you know, I had read that condos, you know, you don't have to worry about those three things, you know, roofing, structural, landscape, and, uh, you know, and yeah, I think those are the three things, the main three things. So uh, because of that, I just got a condo that they, it just came to my lap. You know, like I wasn't even like looking for it. And I was like, you know what? Heck it. Like, let's just go. And then I just did it. And I went on a contract with like 5K earnest money. And I was already on my second one right before I even got paid. So I guess it was like me wanting more, even though I wasn't getting that much money. And then on that other condo, I made like 15K. So I was like, oh shoot, okay, like this is better. This condo took shorter. It was like two months, like like 40, 60 days, 40 to 60 days. And I was like, oh man, this is good. So then I got hooked into the condo and I was like, you know what? Single family is not for me, screw that. So I didn't go back to single family until like another year and a half almost. That's cool. And so from that perspective, how much was that condo? The condo was, this was a cheap condo. It was about 105. 105. And how did you finance it? Uh, hard money lending too as well. Putting okay. how much down? Uh, that one I put about 20K. 20K. So you're, you're flipping your properties with a hard money lender. Yes. You're putting down 10, 15%. You're flipping it. And then what are you roughly making per flip? Let's go with the condos and then we're going to jump over to single family. What were you making per condo flip? Condo on average 20. 20,000. 20, and how long did it take you to do them? But on average, I would say 60 days. 60 days. And then how many were you doing at one time? At your like peak? At, that, at my peak, I did six. So you're having over, if you did that a couple of years, so you're, you're having over half a million dollar years in profit just on flips. Yeah. Holy shit. My man, and at 14, you didn't speak English, and you were flipping burgers at Carl's Jr. You no, know, and and this year we're on a on a route to hit seven figures for sure. Let's go. Heck okay, yeah, bro. so let's let's talk about that. So that's a great transition. Now you're doing flips on really big houses, like like some nice stuff I've seen on your social. So talk to us about that. Why the transition from comfortable money to more risky money? Yeah. So one of the big things on that is uh, I, I got a partner. So we're both uh, into this game together. Now we got... Is he, in, is he or she in Colorado? Yeah, he's in Colorado too. Okay. Well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's in Colorado as well. Um, but we kind of got more into a niche where we see like less competition. So we're focusing on three things. We're focusing on a structural foundation homes, like problems. Uh, meth homes, like meth use or meth labs. 
And then the other big one that we do in a lot is luxury homes, like luxury flips. Uh, we see less competition in all those three. So those are our bread and butter, I would say right now. And just the, I guess the, the main change for these is because of spreads. The spreads are amazing. Like a structural and meth homes, most people are running away from them. But at the end of the day, it's just what I tell everyone, it's just getting a quote. You just get the quote, you put that into your sheet as, a, as part of an expense, like how much you're going to spend and, and literally do your math like that and boom, you're together. You, 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 you get that number and then if you're profiting, you're good. On those, we usually get a 200K spread at least. And then the luxury homes, the luxury homes I love actually, but you do spend a lot of money. We have three luxury homes and we're spending on mortgages over $25,000. Wow. Like it's, yeah. it's, you're, you're burning money like crazy, but that's something I have to admit about luxury flips. But the things I love about luxury flips is that you are setting your own comps. The reason why I say that is because when you look at more luxury flips, they're, they are like your old homes. Like, don't get me wrong. They're big 4,000, 5,000 square foot, but everything is brown. You know, they got the old carpet, you know, they got the handrails that are all brown. Like everything is outdated. But, but they're still selling for like 1.2, 1.3. Now, when you bring my home around them, we're able to push like 1.5, maybe 1.6. And when, you, when we both go on the market, which home do you think they're going to they're gonna pick? They're going to pick my home. Obviously. And that, that's what I love about luxury flips because you're able to push that ARV, that after repair yeah. value, you're able to push it. So right. That's something I really like about the luxury flips. So two questions here. One of them is going to be on the foundation part first, because yeah. I would be... Because realtors will tell their buyers, stay the hell away from foundation problems. But I agree <laughs> a with little Rafael, bit. A little because bit. a foundation <laughs> issue could cost you a hundred grand to fix. And if you got a $200,000 spread on it, who cares? You actually made yeah. money on the issue. But go ahead, Diego. Yeah. I know where you're going with this. Well, the thing is, it would make me a little bit uneasy, right? Because you can yes. get a quote, but then when they when they fix the foundation, let's say that they do that and then the pipes burst under the foundation. Now you're dealing with like fixing the pipes. You also, if it's an easy foundation fix just outside, you don't have to change the flooring or anything like that. But once they do that, if it's, if they have to add piers inside the house, yes, they can literally like, it can shift the frame. It can break windows. There are so many things. And sometimes you can see the results like a few months later, not even like right there because the foundation has to settle too. Um, now, let me see if I have this right, Rafa. <laughs> when, you, when you get a foundation done, there is an insurance that comes with it for a certain amount of years. Is that right? Yes. You there. also get an engineer letter though. Yes. So that engineer letter is like my, my number one thing, you know, to have. So it's, uh, but, but yeah, you're, you're correct about that, uh, uh, Diego. Cause I mean, things can always shift within time, you know, all that stuff, but, but, you know, as long as we do our, you know, our work, we get that letter. I, I, I say my work is done. You know, we have a warranty on it. I think it's like five years. Uh, but I mean, you know, we disclose all that. I flip the home. Everything is that if something happens, they can call that person and, you know, deal, the owner can deal with that person, you know, but. But most of the time, you know, we, we do everything, you know, by the book, we're not trying to screw anyone over, you know, we don't fix little things, yada, yada, and call it a day, you know, so we, we make sure that, you know, the house is not going to fall on them, you know, afterwards. So, but most of the time, I mean, I'm, I, I usually try to stay away from those big cracks, like the house looks like if you close the door, like the house is just going to fall. Like I try to stay away from those like big, big ones. The most I spend on like a structural foundation, um, you know, estimate or, or quote, it's been 20K. 20, okay, actually right. 20, 25k 25k has been the most okay. uh because uh, here in colorado i guess they don't move too much or they're not too old in denver most things are getting scraped or there's you know there's houses from like 19 20 and up usually so um but yeah it's a little stuff sometimes we gotta add piers sometimes we gotta pull we gotta strain the walls you know we fix all the cracking and all that so i mean I mean, it's, it's, it's just minor stuff, but yeah, a lot of people that stay away from them because they just see foundation. They're like, Oh, you know, the house is going to fall. You know, we, we, I mean, aside from that work, we have to sometimes pour driveways pour you know, a little bit of the sidewalk or of, uh, you know, the steps to make it look a lot better. Now, are you using hard money to also fund the flip, the, the flip part of it? Like, like to, to dump him the rehab, to, the rehab, the rehab. no, no, the rehab, no. No, I am not using it. The reason you for that hella, is because, you have hella points. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the reason for that is because, like, I I felt, uh, at least my myself, is that it delays me a little bit. I like to go, go, go. But when you're getting, because you have to get draw, so you have to spend your money, and then somebody comes out and makes sure that you've used all the materials that you say you use, and then you pay this much, and that work is done. So somebody has to come out there, you have to schedule it, and then if they say it's done, then they give you a draw. So let's say you spend 10K in materials of labor, somebody has to go out there, and then they refund you your money. And that to me is just like a lot of work and a lot of, you know, back and forth and for where I can just fund it. You know, I just fund it myself and we just go, 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 go. and don't have to ask anybody for that. I love that. That's, that's perfect. Um, you know, it's interesting hearing your conversations now versus when I've interviewed you in the past and even had you at rat race to come speak, you definitely sound a lot more mature, but not just that you sound a lot more like, real estate educated like you really know what you're doing now it's really cool to see so i want to do a follow-up question is what's next you went from flipping condos to now flipping luxury well i mean what's what's next level for rafael what's in the next five years yeah so that's that's a that's a good question actually um so i am dude you should so go I'm buy a- carl's jr you should go buy that <laughs> i know out. right <laughs> Yeah, so so there's actually a, a few businesses that I that I'm getting I got my eyes on. So so definitely I want to keep flipping. Uh, probably stick more to the luxury side, um, and I'm buying rentals as well. So I have some talks on Airbnb. So we're working on on a little bit of that on, on vacation rentals. So I'm doing a little bit of that. I want to start a few a few things that I have in the works, like uh, a concrete company, uh, dumpster company. So those are all things that I that I want to do. Uh, I, I, my cousin is coming from Peru, moving here in January. So I might start flipping appliances with him because I, I just like to collect appliances and it's just easy stuff. Easy money. Dude, I've seen you. Okay. So let's talk about that before we end the podcast. I've seen you do that. You go pick up appliances on Facebook. They're brand freaking new or scratch yeah. and dent and they look amazing in your flips. Can you give us that hack just so that people yeah. kind of know what you're doing there? Because I've seen you. Yeah. Post- yeah, so everyone, so this is, I, I include myself on this. So I used to always buy new appliances for all my flips until somebody told me, was like, dude, what are you doing? And I was spending like, on a condo, I was spending like 2,500 on a house. I was spending like five Gs. It was so expensive. And then somebody's like, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're, you're even generous to give them appliances. So I started, they're like, you should just face a marketplace. Or, and I was like, okay, well, and then this, this guy was like, hey, I'm getting, I'm getting full sets of appliances for like, Eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, all semi new or brand new. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna give that a try. And I started doing that a year ago, and then it's it's been saving me so much money. And at the same time, I'm just like collecting. I have storage. I'm collecting appliances. I, I I flip them from time to time, and you know, I post them and everything. It's because like a lot of people in Facebook Marketplace, they're moving or they're in a hurry to sell. So we just negotiate, you know. And like yesterday, I picked up a brand new, like with package and everything, like last night, literally. Um, it was like a thousand dollar, uh, fridge and the guy had it posted for 500, you know, we negotiated a little bit and I got him down to 350. Nice. Boom. And I, and I don't have a truck, so I have to rent the Home Depot truck. So <laughs> that's actually, that's actually my next thing. I need to buy a truck. No, Dude. no, you don't. No, you don't. You need to solve <laughs> that problem by hiring somebody to go do it for you yes, because your time exactly. is worth more than go buying a truck. You need to hire somebody. Yes. And say, hey, every time you do a delivery, because you're saving thousands of dollars by not buying. Yeah. So yeah. hire someone and say, hey, every time I got a delivery, I'll pay you 150 bucks to go pick it up, drop it off. And you don't got to worry about nothing. All you got to do is have them send you pictures. And here's the other hack. You just get a virtual assistant to manage that for you. Hey, VA, four hours a day. I need you looking on Facebook to find the best refrigerator deals. Have this person right here. Send him to go pick him up and put him in the storage until we need it. I'm telling you, you do not yeah. want to buy a truck. Well, I, I have I, one well, and everyone wants it. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because my cousin is actually coming in January. So I'm going to have him handle, I'm going to give him a salary, a yearly salary. And he's going to be running a few of the businesses that I have that I'm going to I'm gonna pursue. So, but yeah, it's one of them is that. I just see a lot of uh, interest in appliances in Colorado. At least. I think anywhere. Like if you think about it, nobody can live without real estate. Nobody can live without cars. Nobody can really live without appliances. Nobody can really live without couches or, you know, furniture. So those are all essentials for everyone. So 
you know, it's like my head or my ideas is all the businesses, the ideas that I have are surrounded all those, all those four things. Like I love cars. So we're, I'm in talks with like a body shop or uh, stuff like that right now for next year. So we, we're going to see what happens. So yeah, I, I have all these ideas that I'm, I'm definitely going <laughs> to gonna push through this year. That's I'm cool. excited to see it, man. You definitely dude. have an entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, dude. But if you do end up getting a truck, like you can still hire somebody out to go use it but because you're going to yes. be making like seven figures this year this is the last year for you to get if you buy it with your company yeah, this is the first true. this is the last year that you can appreciate a hundred percent of that car a hundred percent uh so use now, that get it as a tax strategy let me let me add something to that rafael uh, here's another reason and, and the reason i know this is because i owned a moving company for three or four years don't buy a truck. Here's why. Let's say that person gets hurt. Let's say they drive over their grass. It is your responsibility. You're flipping no, seven you. figure. No, dude, hire somebody to do that yeah. because then it's their responsibility, not yours. I'm telling you, stay away. No, yeah. Like, to be honest, I don't see myself in a truck. Uh, I've never had a truck. I always told myself, even growing up, I was like, I do not want a truck ever, 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 ever. But, but, uh, I mean, we'll see what about, but I have my cousin coming. He, he said he likes trucks. So, Hey, if he buys a truck, there that's you good, go. You know? there I, don't, you I don't have to worry about it. Hey, it, it's funny that you're talking about the, the moving thing. Cause like, uh, I got my eyes on, uh, just because my business, we, we've been doing a lot of, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, when you put furniture on the house, what is that business called? I just, I just, I just uh, where, where you are, uh, um, staging, 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 staging. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, so I've been, I started staging about a year ago and I just been spending so much money. So I'm like, I'm like, man, I just want to have my own staging company. So that I, that's on the works too uh, when my cousin gets here. And I'm, I'm going to need one of those U-Haul because I last time, I, every time they deliver, they deliver in those big box trucks when they're delivering the, uh, the staging stuff. Yeah, so. dude, moving business paid a lot. I'm not going to lie. I made six figures every single year um, in the moving business and staging. Yeah. Like, yeah, dude, we made a lot of money. It's just something that I couldn't do anymore because I was doing real yeah. estate. So I literally just shut down the company. They wouldn't the other ni lo vendi. I just shut it down. Um, but yeah, yeah, dude, there's a lot of money because who the hell wants to carry couches upstairs, right? Yeah. Like you, like yeah. it's it's hard work, but it pays very very well. Like I would make 120 to 150 an hour personally. Yeah, I mean, my last because uh, I have a, a home right now that is live on the MLS for 1.2, and I paid 3,500 for staging on that one. Then I had a smaller home for like half a mil. I pay like twenty five hundred, and yep. I'm like, they they own all this stuff. It's like all they do is rent it out. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like crazy, but yeah, it's it's because like I I kind of want to also own everything that I use. I guess it sounds kind of selfish, but I kind of just want to keep everything myself in within the business. Oh, I get it. In house, yeah, yeah. But but as far as the real estate side, um, you know, get more short term rentals or long term rentals. Uh, and then getting a little bit into the Airbnb game and then just jump into the multifamily. We've been looking at a few uh, multi, we put, we submitted a few offers, uh, on some, uh, you know, four four point two, but nothing has gotten accepted yet. Um, but it's something that we, we've been, we've been looking, looking forward to, and, uh, hopefully we land something before the year ends. Yeah, dude, it's, uh, it's really good to like, sure. You have your money machine. Right. I'm a big believer yeah. in that people that are in the red risk on in the group, in the mastermind, they understand of whenever I talk about you have to build your money machine, whether it's wholesaling or being a realtor. Those are just two examples. Um, and on the flipping side, too. Right. You're flipping properties. You can make twenty two hundred thousand right from from that perspective yeah. per flip. But it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you keep and invest. So it's really cool that that you are investing um, for passive income in the future, or even if it's for for equity, it doesn't matter. But you are reinvesting that money rather than just going to freaking like travel and Vegas and just putting it all on red and seeing what happens. You know, like just fun. Uh, it's really good to see that you're putting it back into work to help you build that that passive income. Yeah. Rafael, how many rentals do you have now? Right now I have uh, seven. Do you have a cash well, flow goal? Do you have a certain amount of rentals you'd like to have? Do you have any goals? No, like that? I do have a cash. Like, okay, like I have seven rentals and they get me about 5,500 uh, cash flow a month. Nice. Uh, but I mean, I'm more focused on like the quality 
like more than the quantity. Yeah. So I think I think this year I'm gonna probably get three more. Uh, so hopefully it gets me up a little bit, like three k, three k more. So maybe closer to eight, nine, and then that's gonna be it for the year. Um, but like like I said, like for me, it's like I'm not in a hurry to to you know retire or whatever the case is. I have I have the flipping business is giving me very very good uh, active income. So I'm really taking advantage of that as as much as possible. But you know, the the most that I make, you know, I make all this money there, but I'm putting a little bit into the short term, I mean the, the long term rentals and then uh just kind of reinvesting everything back into the business as far as you know getting more deals. We have right now we have 14 active projects, 14 flips going on right now. Uh, I have two more rentals in escrow right now, ready to close. Actually, I just closed one yesterday. Uh, and then one Airbnb. So there is about, what is that, 17. We have eight different crews, eight contractors that were they're fully, I guess, working with us. Uh, we keep them busy uh, and I'm hiring. I'm, I'm actually, actually, that's on my calendar today to call places to hire two more uh, crews to bring in because we have way too many projects, not enough people right now. And some yeah. some people can't take two projects at once. They can only do one at once. So uh so that's kind of like the struggle right now but uh we're gonna get through that and uh just try to finish all this that's awesome that's awesome well rafael i don't want to take up more of your time man i know you're a busy dude uh so thanks for jumping on here and and talking real estate with us giving us your story your journey thanks for being vulnerable also um you know hopefully this is inspires other people especially uh anyone who's immigrated to this country to know that you can do it too uh, that it's not, imp is it hard? Yes. Is it impossible? No. Uh, Raphael has done it. I have done it. Diego has done it. So super, super thankful for you jumping on here, dude. Where can people find you? What are your socials? Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually very active in Instagram. So it's Raphael, R-A-F-A-E-L-R-E underscore. Uh, but that's, that's my main one. You can find me on Facebook too, but, uh, that's actually my next goal, uh, this, this month, uh, get bigger on the social media try to push social media a little bit more TikTok and all that stuff. I have so much, I have so much uh, recorded uh, stuff that I've been doing walk walkthroughs on my flips for before and afters. I just have to get down to the computer and edit them. So that's you actually that next too, to my dude. list. Yeah, yeah I know, that right? too. You can get yeah, a VA um, on Fiverr and be like, here, here's what I want to <laughs> do. Here are 10 videos. Let's go out there and make it. Really? Okay. Yeah, they can edit it sure. for cheap. All of for it. Sure. Yeah, dude. For okay, sure. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do that next sure. time, so I don't have to. I don't have to spend time on that. Yeah, Rafael, thank you very much for sharing your story, dude. It's super inspirational. Like, also, since you're DACA and every, and everything cool, it's 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 so cool to see that and and inspiring that you came here at 14, not speaking the language. You were 22 when you could work or drive. I was I was 22 as as well. That's when I could finally work or drive, and I felt like that was the beginning right and then now to making sit over a million dollars in flipping and everything it's like dude that is amazing super inspiring and i know that the audience here is going to leave with a lot of uh, action steps and inspiration thank you guys i love it thanks rafael we'll see you later bro see ya thank you the rap race to buy podcast where we discuss money mindset real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place.